In this video, I go over the differences between UEFI and Legacy Boot. I wanted to preface this video that this is targeted towards the general population. So if you're just getting into it and you don't understand what these are, I'm about to lay them out so you have a better understanding. I'm setting guidelines, not necessarily rules. If you get highly skilled in these concepts, you can bend and even break these rules sometimes in mix and match. However, for today, I want to help the general population, so it's best if you stick to these guidelines. You'll have far less headaches by doing this. Um, just know if you do need something else as far as an advanced setup, it is possible, but far more difficult. Okay, with that out of the way, let's jump right in here and cover what is UEFI. The benefits to UEFI is you get advanced graphics for like, let's say your bootloader wants to do a fancy background and have icons for each one of uh, your boot drives. You can easily set that up in a UEFI. And also there's greater support for large boot drives. If you have over two terabytes that you wanna boot directly from, uh, UEFI is what you'll be using. Now in that same vein, you'll probably want to use GPT. And what that means is that's the partition table. So when you first plug in your drive, you'll get a prompt that says, hey, do you want GPT or MBR? Sometimes it's DOS in Linux, MBR is kind of how Windows refers to it. Um, but you'll get those prompts. And if it's a large drive, it needs to be GPT. Otherwise, the largest partition you can make is two terabytes. So very important to know uh, when you're first getting into this. If you do a GPT drive, you're probably gonna to wanna to use UEFI. And to set that up, you need to make sure your BIOS settings are on point and make sure that you go through and make sure UEFI boot is enabled. You want to disable legacy boot and disable all legacy boot options that go with it. In some motherboards, you're literally disabling three or four options before you switch completely over to UEFI. Again, mileage will vary based on the computer. But with those two concepts, that's a UEFI boot, just in a broad, quick nutshell. Um, but that's the why you'd want to do that. But I want to tell you, it is far more difficult to set up in comparison to legacy boot, which I'm about to get into. Legacy boot is mainly for compatibility. So a lot of times when I do tutorials, or let's say I'm loading something up in a VM, I almost never will use GPT. I will always just partition that quick share as just an MBR and then uh, just go right in and put one partition on there, make it bootable, and off I go. So that legacy boot also, you cannot do a graphic interface for your boot menu. It's just going to be the traditional textile menu. And you, the partition structure is set up completely different from GPT. So with legacy boot, you're limited to four partitions. If you try to partition a big drive more than four times, you cannot. And I've already talked about the size limitation. Um, but those are the main differences between the two. Um, MBR is kind of like the just quick, dirty way of doing things. And I wanted to cover real fast bootloaders before uh, ending this video because you need to understand how the bootloaders will interface with this structure. So just remember for UEFI, GPT drives, for um, legacy boot, you're gonna want MBR or DOS based uh, drives. If you mess this up, you can always use a partition tool like uh, Gparted or, uh, you know, uh, Parted Magic. There, there's a lot of different uh, tools out there to assist you with this. But just know that there's the actual partition table on the drive, the, and that, that'll dictate what kind of boot that Windows will look for. Linux is a little more flexible than Windows, and I'm about to get into that when I talk about bootloaders right now. All right, so bootloaders. Let's 
get into that. First, I'm going to cover Windows. Windows uses boot MGR, um, and it creates a small partition. Uh, boot MGR is usually about 500 megs, and it's usually called system reserved. In here, it has something called a BCD, and that's just a database that that bootloader needs to load your system. When doing a lot of physical to virtual things in a data center, um, a lot of times I would wipe this out and rebuild it in another thing and just take the data drive and move it and then recreate that. It's entirely possible. Windows has tools in their you know, uh, recovery. So if you go into recovery, go into the terminal, you can do like fix boot, fix BCD. Um, and a lot of this I think is actually built in. Windows 10 is a little different and they've done, uh, kind of compiled all those tools into one tool. Um, and the name's escaping me right now, but I'll probably make a separate video just over recovering and redoing um, that specific bootloader. Just know that boot MGR does that. Uh, it is, it, most of the time I find it does make an MBR based drive. Um, however, it does use UEFI for the most part, um, especially in new laptops, almost everything is UEFI. So it kind of breaks that rule. I kind of dictated the front there, but that's okay. Um, just know that uh, it's going to have that other partition. And if you delete that partition, you will not be able to boot. Uh, in the past, in Windows XP and way, way long ago, it was called NTLDR, and it was a completely different bootloader compared to this. This bootloader came out in Vista and uh, kind of revamped it and made UEFI possible for Windows. It uh, is real hacky, and I don't particularly like the bootloader. If you're just booting Windows, it's fine. However, if you're doing a multi-boot, I highly recommend you not using uh, your Windows bootloader as your primary because, again, I don't particularly care for it, but that is how it is structured. Now let's get into Grub. That's the other big bootloader that I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm not going to talk about Lilo and any other depreciated ones from the past because that's just it. it they're in the past. So for Grub, um, it has two main things. Grub's capable of doing legacy and UEFI fairly easily. And it's important to know they, they segregate it out much easier than Windows does because Windows, there's different versions of the boot MGR. Some do UEFI, some don't. And the older versions, you have to stick with UEFI and GPT or do a a legacy and MBR. But for Grub, you have a ton of flexibility. Most of it is actually uh, dictated by the boot portion. So from the root, it goes into boot. And from here, you can actually put your Grub uh, configuration in and boot legacy from there. Now, the EFI directory, which would be in boot, is typically mounted to a completely separate partition. And when that partition is set up uh, for, it's a GPT drive, it'll be set up at the very, very front of the drive. So at 2048, your GPT drive will be there at a minimum of 300 megs. I highly recommend at least 500 megs. That's just my personal preference. So when setting up a UEFI, remember two partitions, the very first partition, 500 megs, and it has to be classified as a EFI file system. And when you go to format that partition, make sure it's FAT32. Otherwise, the EFI partition will not work. Now, you didn't hear me say anything about the legacy portion of this. When formatting a partition in the legacy boot or an MBR, it's way easier because you're just doing one partition. For instance, if it's just a quick uh, VM I'm throwing up, I'll go ahead and just do one partition go into my partition editor of choice, whether that's FDisk or Gparted or whatever I want to use. Um, I just create one big partition. It can be an ext4 or an NTFS. I can do a lot of different things with that depending on the file system or the operating system I'm loading. But the main thing with those MBRs is I create that one partition, I mark it active and bootable, and then away I go. A lot of times, uh, I think it's CF disk. All you have to do is do bootable. It automatically, I think, marks it active. Um, just know that 
The legacy boot has something called flags. When I say bootable or active, that's a flag for it. Don't look for those flags in GPT because they don't exist. So it's really important to kind of know because I see some guides. I was just doing a bunch of Arch installs and kind of making my own script. And I was going through other people's work because why reinvent the wheel? And I was seeing a lot of mix and match. And I was like, hey, uh, this is going to confuse some people coming to the space. So just remember those two things. The guidelines here, guys, is UEFI and GPT. And you're going to do two partitions for that. Well, the first one will be um, formatted as an EFI file system and also formatted as FAT32. And then for legacy boot, you just do legacy boot, MBR or DOS. And then you would just format it as your data drive and mark it bootable. So when you make that partition, make it bootable and then format it to whatever file system you need and you're good. So that's it. I just kind of wanted to, hopefully that, that makes sense. It's a very complex subject and you can break those guidelines. Like I said at the very start of this video, I'm leaving articles in the description. These two articles are fantastic and may help you um, kind of go through. So this is kind of like the too long didn't read version of those articles that uh, is a very just high level point of view. 99% of you, if you follow those guidelines, it's gonna end up great for you. If you break those guidelines, hmm, it may work, but it's probably not, especially on the first go around. It is very difficult to mix and match them and break these rules um, without seeing some consequence. It just depends on what tools you use to partition your drive and other things like that when you get into the complexities of this. But if you follow those guidelines, a lot, almost any tool will work. Uh, I will warn you against using CFDisk for GPT or UEFI um, because CFDisk just isn't compatible with it. It's an old Linux-based tool that's mainly meant for the legacy. And remember, legacy boot, came out in the 80s and UEFI kind of came in about in the late 2000s. So very important to know the differences between the two. Most people would opt for the UEFI because it's pretty, especially on my main system here. Of course, I do UEFI, but uh, it is far more difficult to install just because you have an extra partition and extra options and you just need to know how to set it up properly. So that's it for today's video, guys. I hope you liked it. I'm sure I'll get some comments. Please pay attention to the comments section because some people will probably drop some other helpful hints and articles in there. And uh, again, check the description for the long-winded version of this that kind of really breaks down and gets in the nitty-gritty of these two subjects.